right, we're going to open up a, the uh, Board of Elections meeting for uh, May 2nd, 2022. I'm Peter Kaczynski. I have Commissioner Casale, and I have Commissioner Kellner, and I have Commissioner is he on, Andy Sano is on line. Correct, Commissioner? Yes. Yeah. Let me make sure everybody's here. And we will open up today with the minutes from March 4th, 2022. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Our next order of business are ballot access determinations. So staff over the last couple of weeks has been going through petition challenges that were submitted and petitions themselves that were submitted here at the board. And with the hearings, we have before us a report of the uh, staff on those hearings and their recommendations for the status of the petitions involved. So we have a document that we can consider as a whole, which I think is what we will do if that's okay with all the commissioners, and we will rule on them all at once. Um, so before we start, is, are there any comments that any of the commissioners want to make on this? Or? <coughs> Any issues? Okay. Uh, I do see we have people here in the room today, and I don't know if you're here for that particular purpose, but if you are, uh, you know, you're welcome to make some comments regarding any any specific item that's on this list. I don't know if you've seen the list, but if you're here, you're probably here because of a hearing. And if you want to make a comment regarding the status of a particular petition, you know, you're welcome to do that uh, at this point if the commissioners are amenable to that. So I'm not sure who's here if someone wants um, to uh, identify themselves. I'm uh, Michael Gregg, candidate uh, for Lieutenant Governor. Okay, Michael, we'll give you the first uh, you know, right. talk. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I appreciate the audience, and uh, it, it, it's very uh, important for me, and I think for the Republican Party in the state of New York, but uh, uh, on um, Friday, I was I was here for my hearing in terms of my petition challenges uh, lodged uh, by two objectors and, and uh, my challenger for the Republican nomination for the Senate governor. At that point in time, on um, I was advised on Thursday that I needed to have my comments in by Thursday at 12. I showed up here on Friday morning uh, um, to uh, at the hearing. I think that was at 12. Uh, at that time, I had not been given any tally of what the uh, staff of the DOE believed were the number of signatures that I produced, nor was I given a tally of the number of signatures found out. Uh, I was also not uh, given a certain worksheet uh, by the staff in regard to their findings. Uh, the first uh, item of business was the number of the total number, the raw number of signatures. I was advised that I qualified in terms of the number of uh, uh, signatures required in the uh, uh, congressional districts, and there wasn't an issue with that. The only issue with my petition was the raw number. I was given a raw number by the hearing officer of, I believe, of 14,829, which departed from my tallies, uh, my campaign's tallies of over 16,500. Um, Unfortunately, I wasn't given the opportunity to uh, to see what how they tallied their numbers and why there was a discrepancy. I objected to their numbers at the time, saying that their numbers were wrong, and also to the number of signatures that were out. Having left, uh, I had certain other uh, issues with some of the positions that they ruled out. However, the raw numbers was the most important to me because that was the basis on which they were uh, invalidating or made a recommendation to you to invalidate my petition. Uh, over the weekend, I was able to do an Excel spreadsheet. I used their worksheets, their tallies on their worksheets, not only the total tallies, but every individual line tally, added them all up two or three times. I've come out with a number uh, uh, that was completely different um, than the uh, VOE staff numbers. Uh, I came in early this morning. I had a discussion with uh, uh, Mr. Valentine. Uh, and asked him that if he could do me the courtesy of just rerunning that number of out because that was, a, I think, they had 4,000, um, uh, no, excuse me, 1,000, uh, let's check the number they had. They had uh, 1,468. Their worksheet tally totals 
totaling the totals came up to 1369 totaling the individual lines total to 13 1396 uh, that's their own numbers their own numbers it's the number of six signatures was 16 uh, 385 not uh, uh, not uh, um, uh, not uh, I think 16, um, 297 was their total. They just asked them, this is math. They told me they can't do anything because my objectives aren't here to be heard. And so this is not, not asking you to make a qualitative decision as to the signature or the petition. I'm asking you to just redo the math. Because based upon the math, uh, the, the uh, number of signatures um, is completely different when, when we ran the numbers over and over and over again. I was told then that the worksheets that I have are not the worksheets that they work over. There's another set of worksheets, but I never got those worksheets. So I don't know if I'm misinterpreting them or they're saying that there's other worksheets that I didn't get. I was told somehow that they, I asked them, well, how did you get the numbers to put on the commissioners, the, the, the hearing officers report? They told, they were told that by staff. So I said, well, did they tell you verbally or did they write it down? They wrote it down. I think I was entitled to see what they, what objections they sustain to the signatures. Um, so th that is that in, in terms of the signatures. I also, um, in order to qualify, and it's the margins, uh, I'll give grant you that, but I need 15,000. Uh, there are two sheets um, that in addition to the miscalculation and signatures that put me over 15,000. One of them is a sheet that they disqualified based upon the subscribing witness that put their address in the, in the subscribing witness statement and put their zip code after their Yonkers, New York, and wrote 10705. They didn't like the way the one, the zero was written after the one thing was an alter, alteration to the address of the witness. It's the zip code, which does not have to, it's, it's superfluous information, does not have to be included in the witness statement at all. And an alteration to an extraneous uh, 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 piece of information, which just confirms that the witness is from Yonkers, shouldn't be no basis to disqualify that sheet. That's 12 signatures. There's another signature, another signature page that a notary notarized had done above the notary state, but above the notary signature on the statement is the number of signatures that he notarized, which was 20 signatures. The 20 signatures line is the 20 is written in the line to the subscribing witness, not necessarily in the in the line for where the notary would otherwise put it. But all the pertinent information to verify that the notary actually sworn in 20 Republican voters and got 20 signatures is on that and on its face. It's not. This is not a qualitative judgment. This is a, this, this is on its face. Those are also valid signatures and based upon the, the discrepancy and uh, using the BOE's own worksheet numbers, not my numbers, their numbers, the numbers they use to. To, to uh, make a recommendation to you to invalidate my petition, those numbers are mathematically wrong. So math, plain math are wrong. The other two, uh, I am over the 15,000, and I would like the board, at least de minimisly, to ask the staff to rerun the numbers. I bet if Mr. Giuliani is going to speak, I bet you the time he's done speaking, they could have the numbers back. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, all I'm asking for, you know, Again, we're in an age where we're looking for transparency, we're looking for voter participation, we're looking to actually make every voter's, every voter's vote count. We're also looking to engage our Republican base in the process. We want people to be engaged in the process. We, go out, we have people that are going out and collecting signatures in March, which upstate New York is not a pleasant thing to do. Uh, and given the weather, we can have everybody out there engaged. I, I have over 16,000 Republican registered voters that would like to see my name on the ballot, to have a choice for the, for the office of lieutenant governor. We are, we are here to promote that. You're, this is your job is to promote that, that, that engagement by each, every voter and, 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 and member of our party. You have somewhat some archaic rules. Uh, we will be challenging the uh, uh, the disqualification of signatures where there's a wrong town or city entered, but there's a post office address. There's good case law that would say that the town is only, that the, that does, the issue of the information at the town is only important where a post office address may encompass more than one political subdivision. 
So you don't know whether that registered Republican voter is qualified to vote in the primary for which the circulating nom the nominating petition is circulated. In the case of a statewide office, anyone that is registered with the post office address in the state of New York and is a Republican is qualified to vote in the primary in June 28th, and their signature should be made valid. Not do so, I think, is a, is, is a, is a grave injustice both to the state of New York and, most importantly, to our party, of which I'm a member, which is a Republican party. That choice should be made. You are the last <laughs> uh, 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 stop that I have before I go to court. And quite frankly, the difference between going to court with a, with a petition that on all rights should be validated, declared va valid, as opposed to a, a, a petition where I have to go uh, bring an order to court to validate it as a both as a substantive a procedural um, difference and that can, that, that, can, that can affect the outcome. And I, I know I, I, I have been in public office, I've been a council provider, I've been an executive position, I know how difficult it is for staff to do their job, especially under very trying conditions. But I am not asking them to do much. I'm, I told them I could, do, I, could, I could do the calculation here for you on my iPhone and show you that the number out is wrong, it's not credible, the number of signatures, qualifying signatures that submitted it's not right. It's a miscalculation on that as well. You do it. Uh, I only need 15,000, but when you do we do the calculation at 15,001, and taking the other two sheets, uh, 15,033, 15,000 is all I need, and, the, and that's and that's what the law requires. I'm looking for the due process, and I'm hoping that you, as, as a, a commission, also uh, have deep respect for the due process and procedural aspects of going forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I just want to note for the record that uh, this, this particular petition, uh, as Mr. Grace indicated, needed 15,000 signatures. Uh, the number that were filed, according to our numbers, was 16,398. And then after the hearing and the objection process, the result uh, of valid signatures was 14,829, which, uh, as noted, is short of the 15,000. And thus, uh, that's the report that we have in front of us. I'm just going to hold you off a second. Uh, and, I, and so, staff, I don't know if you uh, have any comments regarding Mr. Grace's assertions regarding the calculation of the numbers. We would make one change to that calculation that the number filed would be 16,297. I'm sorry. It's not 16,398, it's 16,297. Which was almost reported at the hearing and confirmed that. Okay, so the, so the number submitted was slightly less than what I thought. Okay. Okay. the number validated. 1,468. Right, that's what I have. And and based on that calculation, it's 14,829. Is that still correct or is yes. that different? That's as well? So the 14,829 is correct. Yes. Okay. And who actually did the count? Uh, several different people. Um, uh, it, four or five staff members, in addition to uh, Ms. Dabrowski Savitsky, and then myself confirming that. And the worksheets will be available? They are available, yes. Okay. 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 Anything else? Any other time? Yeah, did, did you have a response to that? Or did you just want to? Yeah. You look like you wanted to say something. We're, we're going to keep it short. Okay, I don't go ahead. No, I'll keep it right short. You're making fun of I I ask really, the, the number out makes no sense whatsoever. I don't know where they got it. I went through their the numerous occasions. It's 1396. I don't the number of submitted signatures is more than 16398 here. But given you a 16, 16398 and the actual number of, of uh, found out, I qualify. And all I'm asking for is that I, I, they produce no data. As they told me they did it on a tape. We did it with Excel spreadsheet using their numbers and their entries. And, it, and, and unless they have a second set of papers, that I didn't get. Fair enough. How many staff have looked at this? Five to ten. Five to ten. Yeah. And they've each looked at it independently and confirmed our numbers? Is that a correct statement? That would no? be a correct statement. That's a correct statement. So third, the, the 14829 was the number, which is the critical number here, the number valid. Correct. 
14829 is the number that the staff has, valid, has, has validated as valid. That's correct. I would note, uh, you know, to Mr. Grace, certainly some of the arguments you're making here today are really more appropriate for court action. I mean, you're contesting, I think, the uh, legitimacy of certain signatures based on whether it's a, a, a error or whether it's a correction. It's things the courts would typically weigh in on and have weighed in on over the years. And we follow the directions of the court. As you might imagine, we're an administrative agency. Uh, you know, our job is to, you know, take the petition in, look at the law, and then apply the law to the petition. Some of your arguments are that, you know, the law is not right. Those are arguments you have to make in court. Absolutely. So those aren't things we can consider um, here today. So I just want to note, note okay. that to you as well. I'm, all, all I'm asking for is the correct mathematical mm -hmm. additions and subtractions. Fair enough. And, and I'm asking that they just show how they came up. Uh, because if they said they, they said they, they couldn't, just, they, they punched one, they, I think you're using a calculator. Ah. You should be using an Excel spreadsheet because that doesn't matter that you go along. I can't believe that the BOE in a state election sits there with a calculator punching in numbers because they're telling you right now the numbers are wrong. And all I ask for, the, believe me, if you if you go through the number counted out, it literally would take, it's, it's a, I think it's a matter of 32, 35 numbers to add up. I could do it right here and show you that they're wrong. Unless they have some sheets with different numbers that they've never given them. But I, it, it, it literally, you can ask them to just go out, take the numbers, put them in a line, gotcha. and add them up. And, and, if, and if, if I'm wrong, I will apologize for having wasted any of my time with, with any. I really will. Yeah. So I, I just want to join in uh, Commissioner uh, Kaczynski's remarks that as a ministerial agency, we really have to um, uh, apply the statute as it is written. Um, I think you make two interesting points to raise in court uh, on the alteration to the zip code, but it is an alteration to the witness statement, and the law is pretty clear that um, uh, alterations to witness statements need to be initialed by the subscribing witness. Um, and then, um, uh, there have been uh, uh, court rulings that have gone both ways on the issue of uh, uh, including the proper town in the uh, petition. So you may um, be able to convince a judge to do that, but the statute hasn't been amended. And there are cases uh, that still have been uh, upholding the statutory requirements. And as to the count, um, uh, I'm inclined to uh, take at face value uh, uh, the report of our senior staff who've uh, spent time going over this and uh, doing the count. But uh, uh, I want to assure you that you are entitled to all of those worksheets. And if there is an error, uh, in the calculation, then um, you should uh, point it out to us. But uh, given the time and the fact that you are in court, um, uh, I, I agree that uh, what the staff has done um, should be upheld by the commission. And I, I then ask that I be produced with the, uh, the, if it was the number found out their calculation sheets and their actual calculations because I don't have never gotten it. So no gotten. And supposedly there's a second there's gotta be a second bunch of them out there because their numbers are, they got two different numbers. And this is and, and that know, is becoming critical. That as to what what is if it's qualifying or not qualifying. You're putting me I, I understand all the real fine points of law, but that's not you're you're you're, you're right, you're an administrative body. <laughs> Your discretion is and, now. And you're entitled to the worksheet. So I'd like that. And that'd be right? Is there any problem? No. Can no. send you the worksheet? Yeah. Can I, can I have, get a copy before I leave? Um, it's thousands I, and thousands of pages. So we'll, we've, we we're going to send them. you a link. Because <laughs> we're going to scan them. 
Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're entitled. Okay. All right, thank, thank, thank you for your time. And, okay. And uh, hopefully you will be wrong. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So that's uh, Mr. Grace. We have other members yeah. here from the public. Is there anybody else that wants to be heard on a specific finding uh, regarding the petition matters? Sure. Commissioners Andrew Giuliani running for governor. First and foremost, I commiserate with Mr. Grace. You know, as uh, many of you know, in March in New York, going around, we had some wonderful days, but we certainly had some cold Mr. days. Mr. Giuliani, so you can appear on the. Do I get you over here? To stand over here. No um, problem. I always they say I have a face for radio, but that's okay. Great. Right. <laughs> um, I want to thank you very much for your time. I want to thank you uh, for uh, the suggestion on Friday after our hearing that the commissioners uphold uh, our ballot access. As I said, I certainly commis commiserate with Mr. Grace, as I know um, this is a process about the will of the people. And I understand that is your mission and that is your job to make sure that uh, all New Yorkers have a choice, whether that choice be on June 28th or whether it be at some point in August, which we may find out and we may be doing this dance all over again. Um, I want to keep this very brief. Uh, I want to make sure and, and put in a word for all the people that ended up coming out there and not just volunteering, but working and signing for us. I think the original 24,579 signatures at our hearing the other day, uh, four were excluded by candidate Zeldin's counsel. Um, it's, an, it's an honor to have a team that is that competent and that efficient to be able to submit that. So I'm very very excited about the possibility, but uh, I'll focus back on this. Um, all I ask is of the commissioners is that uh, they adopt the findings from the hearing that we be on the ballot uh, for this designated petition, petition for the Republican Party. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions or anything? Thank you. Any other comments then regarding? I would yeah, I would note we have that on the on the sheet that you filed twenty four thousand five hundred seventy nine. Signatures. Um, I'm sorry, somebody, okay. Just identify yourself and now Paul Nichols, also a candidate for governor for the Democratic Party. Okay, I have an even better face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, uh, again, thank you for the time and opportunity to be able to present before the board. Um, I bring um, serious concerns about <clears throat> the facts and law with respect to the public, with respect to the underlying preliminary hearing. We submitted over 19,000 signatures for ballot access, and in the preliminary hearing, we raised some serious concerns of law um, that respectfully weren't seriously considered. The points of law that we raised in, in specific was uh, lack of the board to have jurisdiction to be able to determine the specific objections. And the basis of that was uh, the objectors not complying with uh, uh, Title IX of the uh, codes of the rules and regulations, uh, section 6204, when it comes to service. In order for, the, as the law says, no specifications of the objections to any petition will be considered by the board unless the objector is filing the specifications personally, delivers or mailed by registered mail or certified mail a duplicate copy of the specifications. Specifically, it talks about proof of service. And it's a legal term when service is registered by mail. It has to be uh, it has to be validated by a stamp of the United States Postal Service as, as being received. It was raised in this preliminary hearing, and the exhibits were attached that the objectors did not comply with this section of the law that would grant jurisdiction to the board to be able to rule on those uh, on those specifications. And so uh, that uh, preliminary hearing error in that again those specifications should have been ruled and deemed, again, based on the law as not being accepted in the 19,000 signatures brought through. Uh, additionally, um, there was a prima facie determination uh, that the petitions were untimely. We, follow, we followed all of the regulations that were put forward in terms of the postmarking by the deadline, which was um, April the 7th. It was uh, done by the prescribed method of mailing, which was uh, the method that was chosen by this candidacy, was the three-day mailing option, and it was it was brought to our attention by the United States Postal Service 
that the board uh, intentionally had mail redirected away from 40 Pearl Street. And at the time at which it was being delivered, it was rerouted away from 40 Pearl Street and was left at the post office, which the board was put on specific notice by myself, called during the day on the 11th of April and notified them. I spoke to uh, uh, one of the staff members and let them know they took in the tracking number. They did see that there was something there and they said that they were going to work on it. Uh, we called back probably um, a little bit later, have actually the, I submitted to the preliminary hearing a, a record of the, uh, of the phone call. To, uh, they said they were working on it, someone was going to be taking care of it, and then we were going to get a call back. The call back never came. We submitted some case law to the um, preliminary hearing officers that indicated that where the candidacies have essentially placed it in, and this is Green versus Annapolis, where the candidacies have essentially done everything that they were supposed to do by law, and it was now it was in the access of the board that it would be unreasonable to hold uh, the candidate responsible for acts that are solely within the board's power to perform, in, in, in this case, retrieving uh, delivery of, of timely mail. Uh, the, the, the case went on to say that to hold otherwise would risk having a candidacy vitiated by inadvertent carelessness, misfeasance, malfeasance, or partisan politics by the board's election, none of which we're alleging here today for the record. But it's very important that again, the law that put down in the uh, in the in the codes and the rules of regulation are strictly adhered to because a number of the premises that some of the signatures were being invalidated were specific points of law, which is very important. And so, in order for this board to have jurisdiction, the law had to be complied with. We provided the exhibits that show that the objectives did not comply with the law and that did not rise for jurisdiction for this board. And then we also showed that the application in, 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 in essence was, was timely, uh, which would make some of the applications uh, specifications and timely as well. So again, these are serious points of law that were not considered were brought with specific exhibits. Again, I can provide that to the board, uh, to the commissioners here today, but we can't overlook that the people of New York are depending on this board to to be the arbitrators of fairness, to be the arbitrators not in certain instances of you know ruling on illegible signatures or things that are missing. These are bigger, broader points that lead to jurisdictional arguments. Again, the people of the state of New York are looking for fairness. They're looking for, as the lieutenant governor candidate said, open participation to encourage candidates to participate. Again, it was very difficult in March to be out there getting signatures, but we did it. And we want to make sure that, again, the process is followed as close as we can so that way those 19,000 signatures can be upheld by the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so as I see this on our sheet, uh, Mr. Nichols uh, filed a Democratic designated petition with 19,786 signatures. That's correct. And that after a hearing, we found 11,767 were valid. Now, as I understand, Mr. Nichols is raising two procedural issues, one being whether the petition was filed on time. Is there a contention that it was not? I don't see it on no, here. the petition was filed. So the, so the timeliness of the petition is not an issue. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So the That's second issue. Uh, but it, well, the timeliness would go back to the date of April the 11th, because April the 11th would be the final day of timeliness uh, filed petitions according to the law. Right. So th there was an issue with the timeliness okay, of the well, filing of the petition, but it was um, there was some ambiguity on the point. So the the board the board um, proceeded with specifications of objections. Okay. Um, the the petition was timely um, placed into the mail stream um, by Mr. Nichols, his agent, or his campaign, um, and pursuant to um, 1106 of the statute. Uh, when you mail something to the board, it has to arrive no later than two um, business days after the last day to file it. The last day to file it was Thursday the 7th. Um, so it needed to arrive by the following Monday. Um, and in fact, the board did not take possession of the document until Tuesday. Um, the, the board had indicated to the Postal Service that the board would be picking up its mail in order to get the mail timely into the building. 
Um, staff went to uh, the post office at 10 a.m. as it is as has always been the tradition of the staff to do. Um, that gives the Postal Service plenty of time to have cased all of the mail that's been received up until that point. Then we receive uh, then we receive the mail. Um, Mr. Uh, Nichols' petition was not there when the staff went to pick it up. Uh, what day is this, Brian? Uh, that would have been Tuesday. That would have Monday. been on Monday. Monday, um, Monday at 10 a.m. They went yeah. to the post office and it wasn't there. Right. Okay. And so then the the records of the post office indicated that um, it they had placed Mr. Nichols' petition out for delivery in the wee morning hours. I think memory serves around 6 a.m. It was out for delivery. Delivery to this so office. Why do you not? Know Presumably, it was a right. to right. you know okay. Indeed, it was. And. So our staff went to get it. It wasn't at the post office. Presumably the post office had it out on a truck. At some point or another, after staff returned um, on Monday, the, the, the documents went back to the post office. Um, and then when the board went to pick the documents up on Tuesday, the documents were in fact there. Um, we have discussed potentially amending our policies as a result of this. Um, but the, but we did not take physical possession of the document until Tuesday, and the Postal Service had had the document in their possession, possession in Albany as of 5 a.m. in the morning on Monday, um, and uh, and such as it was. So there, was, so there being this potential issue with um, you know, some ambiguity on this point, given the unique facts and circumstances, the board did proceed to the line by line um, specifications. I'm in this matter, and the, the numbers are recited on the, the ultimate findings. Okay, so as I understand it, what, our, what we're considering here today is not the timeliness of the petition itself, but the sufficiency of the signatures filed. So that issue is not before us today because the hearing officer did not find the petition invalid for so, lateness. Well, I think, but it's it is the on prima facie. So it's listed on the prima facie count. Right. right. It is. And we did oh, so well? both. Yeah. Oh, okay. So and I don't sorry. see a list on the objection. Yeah, there's one here. It's in, within, the, within, within the hearing. Oh, I see. That. Right here. That's what I was like. I'm sorry. It's also on the prima facie. Oh, okay. Right. So, so did the hearing officer find that his petition was late? The we did not, not rule on the line by line. So why is it on the prima facie? The prima facie review was done at the time that it was taken in by the operations. Unit. And I'm looking, so, I'm looking so, for it actually. So when the prima, so when that occurs, the the issue is not advanced to the hearing officer. Yeah, I have that. Oh man, I have a little Okay. It was removed. Yeah. Prima facie. Prima facie. Part of the issue of transactions. It was removed. Yeah, I don't see him on my prima I don't have it. The prima facie was when it first came in. It was with one time. And in the meantime. Definitive staff report. I'm working on this. We have different. I have a copy of the prima facie in my email. Maybe, maybe you should find a copy. Let's hold on. Okay. Right. Hold on. All right, here's a Nichols. I only have one Nichols on mine. You have, what do you I only have one Nichols. Oh, you only have prima facie? No, he only has the one on the. Um, it says prima facie review and hearing. It's yeah. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I said I, I had there was a hearing held because it's showing me. You know, if there was a prima facie, it's out. You wouldn't have bothered to do a hearing, would you? No. No, I only okay. have the prima facie. So I have the hearing was held and the signatures were reduced from seventeen or nineteen seven eighty six to eleven seven sixty seven. But why is yours at the top and mine is on line three? Well, that's a good question. What do you think about it? We have, a, we have a button now. Wait, it's even on line three. Yeah, it's, it's a different oh. Well, I, I think that the commission. I think I gave you my old copy, the working copy, because you didn't have it. Yeah, but I, I think if we're ruling on these, that there ought to be a definitive copy. There and is. That, 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 is well, this the same as what the other commissioners said? It yes. Be so it, it should be it should be on the bottom. It should be indicated as hearing report 5.2.22.10 a.m. Right here. Yeah. That's what I have. I handed you mine, and then Brian, you asked me where Brian went. Thank he you. went to okay. make copies. So we have the same one. Okay. So I have Mr. Nichols here right. on the hearing, like, as a, right. having had a hearing, 
So now they raised this question of whether the um, certificate of service of the specs was adequate. Right. So what's the story of that? So um, I'll start on that, and Tom can, can provide additional information as necessary. So the, when the um, specifications or objections come in, um, they're reviewed by the operation staff bipartisan to make a determination as to whether or not um, service is uh, adequate. Um, the, the document was uh, reviewed on a, on a bipartisan basis, and they had indicated um, the proof of service um, via certified mail. Uh, staff found it adequate, and um, and I don't think there's much more to say. So it's um, certified mail, and he's it can, be, it can be either meeting. certified. He's or saying registered. that there was no post office stamp, but if it's okay. certified, not no. registered, the post office doesn't require. I I, uh, I don't know the niceties, but I just know they provided the. the there were four different objectors. I believe he alleged that to one objector. No, there was, it was. There were, so two, four different objectives. Two objectives did not follow the the stamp post office receipt, which is required by again uh, Title IX, uh, Section 6204, and then subsections uh, with respect to this to the stamp. Um, the other two, the timeliness, going back to April 11th. The statute says you have three days after the application is filed, which again, we the, the, the idea was to make sure that it was here on the 11th. The specifications, excuse me, the general objections were filed on the Friday, which was outside of the timeliness. Yeah, but the board didn't get it till Tuesday. Correct. And, and frankly, mm -hmm. my view is that um, Unless we affirmatively did something with the post office where we... That's what happened. They now, now, now please don't Sorry. interrupt me, uh, Mr. Nichols, because I'm really talking to the staff people because I think it's factually important. If the post office made a mistake, then that's on the candidate because we don't want... Can I mean, we prefer that candidates file their petitions in person. and. Uh, so the question is, did we do anything that caused the delay in receiving the petition on Tuesday as opposed to Monday? In my opinion, no. Okay. Well, I guess if we did anything, based on the description I'm getting, is we went to the post office at 10 a.m. And if we'd gone at 4, 8, 4 p.m., it would have been there. Is that, is that, is that oh, fair yeah, to say? Yeah, but we're not required because they... The deadline was already passed. It's no, 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 no. I'm talking Monday now. Right. I'm talking Monday. Know, that the post office, for some reason, we can't ascertain. They put it on a truck. So I it got wasn't it. there. I got it. But you don't know when it came back to the post office. It came back. We'd gone down our box. It came back. Was there at 10 a.m.? We don't know what time it was there Monday. No, we have 11. 11. But we did go to the box. We did. We did. Well, you say early. We went there. Yeah, but that's. That's you know, our it's time. I get it. I'm not. I'm not disputing. I'm just saying. If you're saying there was an issue, it's that we went early. It wasn't. Well, are you saying we should go at five? I don't know. But I, don't know. But okay. I, gotta, I, I guess I what I'm uh, saying is, is that I understand. Is that if if you use the post office, then you bear the risk no, of, the, of it not being delivered. Sure. I mean, I guess the issue yeah. to me is that if the if the, if we didn't get it till the twelfth. To hold the objector right. to right. Thursday, like they, because I mean, the idea is the objector should know I've got this petition here on day one, and by day four I have to file my objections, my my general, right? right. So as a as a as a candidate or as a as an objector, I'm using that date that I get it, which is the date the board gets, it, right? The I agree. With the objector you. doesn't know it's at the post office, so right. he gets it on the 12th when we got it. Then he use or he or she uses until Friday the fourth or fifteenth or whatever the thing was Friday three days to object. I think that's the objectors. Right. And side. I guess what I'm adding to this is that unless we and I agree with that that uh, in fairness the objector yeah. should have three days. I mean, let's be fair to you and the objector. All right, but I'm just, but but if unless we did something 
negligent or wrong uh, to delay the delivery, um, that that risk is on the candidate. Mm -hmm. And my advice is that candidates should not use the post office for delivery of petitions, which is something we've been, as an agency, trying to encourage people. But I just think, I just think balancing it, you know, you're, right. getting, you're getting the benefit, in my view, of even though we got it the day late, we're still accepting it because we acknowledge it was lost in the mail somehow that 11th, and we didn't get it on time. Probably and, should have. And I'm not agreeing that that, I'm, I'm saying if it was lost in the mail, that that makes it prima facie. And so you would say it's prima facie. Right. I got but it. regardless, I there were two, uh, one for sure, I believe two of those objections were dated that Thursday, not the Friday. Right. Not so all of the objections. Came in timely. So that's the idea. They just okay. came in earlier based okay. on their notice. Well, all right. Okay. okay. So there are two, uh, two objectors there's were Thursday, least, two objectors were Friday. one for Friday. sure. I'm almost positive there's two. So we have at least one objector that met the Thursday yes. deadline. Right. And the, the, the ones that met the Thursday deadline are the ones that did not follow the, it was not validated by the post office. Oh, I see. I, and I, and I, there's well, no real issue that you're more than 3,000 signatures short in. Didn't have the stamp. Didn't have the stamp. Yes. I, no, you're not contesting the finding. You we're, not, we're, not, you? we're not contesting most. We're not contesting okay. the finding. It's a procedural oh, question. Procedural question. Got it. The other, the other question is a question of law in terms of, <coughs> uh, of, of witness registry of the party, which again, if the board doesn't uh, accept that, we're, we're more than willing to go to the court on that issue. Sure. Right. This sure is the jurisdictional issue. But then, um, with there are other other procedural points that were deficient with the specification. The law does require a duplicate copy to be mailed. So one of the objectors that did get their uh, objection in time, they did not send a signed duplicate copy of the objection. So the the cover sheet was facially different. One was not the, I, I included two exhibits. One was a signed copy that was sent to the board. The other one was a copy that there were numbers written in the object along where a signature should have been, where the, the case law specifically requires an exact duplicate copy be served to, to the candidate. Um, you know, again, which would remove the jurisdictional basis for even reviewing the specifications. Again, I got your numbers. For, for that objection. Numbers, numbers I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. And that was one of the Thursday objectors. Uh, no, that was one of the, the Friday that's objectors. The Friday that's, that's, okay. a, that's, okay. a, that's a Friday objector. Okay. Okay. So the idea is, again, and I, and I recognize the, the position of, of, of fairness, However, again, the, the law does require three days from, from when it was filed. And to, to the commissioner's point, and I, I, I appreciate the point of understanding. I absolutely assume the risk of sending it in the mail. But when the board affirmatively says, we're not going to, you, I'm coming to give you the package. The package is going to be deemed filed when we get it, but we're saying we're not taking it. The, the, the Postal Service. Yeah, but nobody the, said that. No, happened. the Postal Service specifically, I have the record. That, that for the week of when the petitions were due, the Board of Elections had the mail redirected, pushed away from 40 North Pearl, North Pearl Street. And the reason why that it was on a truck is because it was headed towards 40 North Pearl. And the board saying, well, no, we don't want it here. And now it's placed solely in the hands of, essentially what that's what they're saying, where we have to go and affirmatively get it. I'm not alleging a post office breakdown or was lost in the post office because the law is clear on that. If the post office messed up, that's on the candidate, we're out. But it was there from 11 o'clock. There was, there was constructive notice, but then actual notice. I spoke to the same representatives twice to say that there's something in They took the tracking number. They said we're going and we're working on it. So and, and, uh, other than me driving from New York City and saying, okay, I'll pick it up for you and getting it over there, there's affirmative act behavior from the post office with the Denapoli versus uh, Green case says it's unfair for the candidate to, to to have the board perform at that point it's called a ministerial duty of picking up the mail. And again, the difference between 10 and 11 o'clock was there from 11 o'clock in the morning, having been redirected away from the board. Then we're so are you so saying are you saying that we on uh, petition filing week say to the uh, post office, don't bring us the stuff, we'll pick it up at the box. We'd rather pick it up the box than have you bring it to the office. Well, regular mail we pick up. Priority mail and express mail still gets delivered regularly. 
why it went on the truck and wasn't delivered, I have no idea. Right. Okay. But okay. any priority in express mail gets delivered by the post office. They still deliver to us. We just get regular mail we pick up so we can pick it up on our time schedule after they've done the sort that normally would have been out for delivery. So you're saying that should have been delivered? They should have delivered it. They yeah. should have delivered it. And it's the records the indicate that it the went on a truck okay. for delivery. Right. I don't know okay. why the okes. postal yeah. service. I have no idea why it went out on the truck and then came back. And no idea. Okay. okay, they should have delivered it though. They it? should. It wasn't per our we did not have to no. stop. No. Okay. No. But no. that's contrary to what the postal is. But I'll leave that. I'll leave that. Fair enough. Okay. Got it. And then, the, and then the last last point. Again, if the board does adopt the position of, and this would kind of be contrary to the law, of whenever the board makes the applications available. That's when the three-day clock starts. That's contravention to the law. And I understand fairness and, and balance, but something could be filed in the but, board. But we didn't we, receive it. It wasn't filed here until Tuesday. Until we have those papers, we can't stamp them in and file them. Right, and I, and I, I understand that position, but it, it's outside the scope of what the, of what the, what the law would require. Because again, if, it's, if we're saying that you know, we can get it in on a Tuesday, and then for whatever reason, the Annapolis case talked about negligence malfeasance, which we're not alleging here. Yeah, I, it <clears> could <throat> come up. And we're just talking about theory as opposed to how the law works. Mm -hmm. If they didn't put it up until Wednesday, that clock doesn't now start until, you know, we No, I got until, your point. I got your point. But we, we, have a pellet, we have a pellet division authority that the three day objection time frame begins when we physically receive it, not when it's postmarked. No, we're not going by the postmark when, when the filing date, because if you're going to accept it at the right. same time we file, that's, that's mm -hmm. April the 11th. No, yeah. we, 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 we understand. Did you raise these issues at the hearing? I did. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there anyone else here that would like to speak on any of the petition hearings that are in front of us here today? Henry Berger. Henry Berger. Wait a minute, I hear a voice. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm sorry, Henry, you're on the... We see you. I see it now. Okay, go ahead. I'm here with Gregory Sumas on behalf of objectors Diamond, Walsh, and Carney to the des Democratic Designating Petition of Khaled Salem. Uh, we request that the commissioners confirm the clerk's report, and we're really here to answer any questions you might have about the petition, which was an un unusual petition. Let me just uh, note that that is a petition that was filed here, uh, needed 15,000 signatures, 24,970 were filed, and at the end of the hearing, 11,741 were deemed valid. So the recommendation is to invalidate. Is that I would, okay? Yeah. I, would, uh, I would just note that those numbers reflect the staff having assiduously worked three of the five volumes. They never worked the first and the fifth because they didn't have to because you were already, we were already below. There was an issue on the first volume in that the purported uh, subscribing witness submitted an affidavit saying he never got the signatures, that's not his signature. And, uh, you know, our, our contention on that, which we will raise in, uh, appropriately later, is that that entire volume should be invalid also. But the clerk's report is sufficient to invalidate the designating petition. Okay, Berger, thank you. Uh, is there anybody here for Mr. Slim arguing that his petition is valid? No, okay. All right, thank you. Um, any questions for that? No? Any comments on that? Anything else then regarding any other petition that's on this sheet that we are looking right. at here? So uh, with that, I'm prepared to move the staff report, okay. which is the one that's marked 5-2-22-10-A. Correct. That's the one we all have. Yes. Is there a second to that? Second. Okay. Is there any more discussion? Mr. Spano? Nothing? Okay. And uh, we can take a vote. All all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. So that's the status of these now. Uh, candidates, as we all have noted, that may have been validated today are welcome to go to court. They can certainly challenge whatever uh, findings we made uh, in court. They have three days uh, from today. And those who are successful, um, 
I assume we'll go to court. Okay, just sorry, I just because I don't have the sheet in front of me, I assume that the request to validate was approved. Correct? I'm sorry, the, for your petition, yes. it was approved. Right. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank yep. you for your time. Okay, thank you. All right, that's the first order of business, and we wanted to get that out of the way because we knew we had some public interest in that, and we'll now go back into our regular session. We'll start with unit reports. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. In terms of what we would be able to, to use for the report process. Uh, for t of, of, of today, yeah, we can get you something of our finding today. You, you will get a formal... Yeah. You'll get a formal finding. A, a formal one-page finding. We have your email for just your case. Then we'll send it to you. Would that be last day? Yeah, we'll send it, it to should you. Be out, it should be out this yeah. afternoon. This afternoon. Yeah. But you should mm -hmm. okay. not wait for that yeah, to start your court case. Yeah, of course. We actually have everything where we're just waiting to flip it in. Okay. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to go on to unit updates, and we'll start with the executive, Kristen zabrowski Stavisky and Todd Valentine. As you can tell, we've been busy with ballot access process during this time period. Um, pretty much the last few weeks or months, uh, it's taken up our time. Uh, you know, in between that, we have been working on uh, other long-term projects, uh, including working on the procurement for the online voter registration system. Uh, obviously, coordinating with the public campaign finance board for their solicitation that they're doing for their software, um, and just quick summary, we are, we have, obviously space planning is moving forward. It is asking, we're working with OGS and better. It's improved, uh, no question about it. Uh, they are uh, more attentive to us in terms of giving us information. Occasionally they do forget to tell us things, but we do learn and remind them that they should tell us. And, and the, we've had the OGS commissioner support on that. We have asked her to do any support, she's been very supportive. So uh, that's been helpful. Uh, Budget-wise, obviously the budget was adopted as Cheryl mentioned during the public campaign finance board meeting. Uh, we were we got the full fund that we had asked for. Uh, in addition, there was another grant program that was added to support the counties in the new uh, absentee ballot postage program. Uh, so we are starting to get the contracts together. Uh, that would be in effect July 1st. Uh, so. We're going to get the contracts together. It's a reimbursement program, so we, we're telling the county save your receipts on posters that you pay for uh, delivery and return mail. So, um, and we'll just put together the uh, basis for how we're going to distribute that. So, uh, yeah, ballot access took a lot. Perfect. Yeah. It did. <laughs> then I now, now I understand that. Um, you suspended the ballot access ruling for Senate and congressional cases. Well, we felt we had to because the Court of Appeals had, uh, uh, and it wasn't until after the Court of Appeals ruled that they had ruled the lines unconstitutional. And at that point, we were stuck because there could be no primary for them. So uh, it didn't, to us, it didn't make any sense to make rulings on something for which there's no primary for. for the lines. There's no. There'll but be a primary. Most there may be a of primary that work primary. has. Most of that work was close to completion. That would, and you that still would have all your work papers. For yeah. That. Yeah, we still have all of the records. There were just, uh, I would say, a half a dozen hearings that we hadn't concluded, um, and easily could be done in a in a few days. You know, we'd have to provide notice and to conclude the process. But yeah, all the we preserved all of the records. We also encouraged the county board. We told them we'll be sure to help them through this process because obviously they were uh, asking for direction. And we asked them to preserve everything that they had to just put it in the filing cabinet and leave it. And we have a call scheduled with the city board to try to do that tomorrow morning right. specifically address any of their issues. What are those issues? I mean, I understand the city board actually finished their rule. Well, I think they're they're trying to work. Yeah, they're concerned the with two the schedule towards the now, but yeah. now that the court, the district court or the the court judge has issued the 
August 23rd primary, they're interested in you know the interplay of that. We did advise the county board that we're going to come down at our last call on Thursday. Um, you know, the city board wanted uh, wanted time to schedule just to walk through their issues. I don't know exactly what issues they would have other than how what time frame would they need in order to migrate the voters from the old line to the new line. Previously, they had told us anywhere from approximately three weeks it takes to move the entire voter file, but this would be a subset of that. So it would be a little bit different than what you would normally do on a redistricting. Um, so it lends that question. Uh, and depending upon when changes occur with the ballot access for the August primary, um, you also have uh, there's a change of enrollment period uh, that, that kicks in after the June primary. Uh, what one would get is your primary, so that may overlap the. It may not, depending right. on you what gets ordered. Well, you could call the August 23rd the June primary. Uh, well, that's mm -hmm. just one of those. It's one of those issues the county board could raise, right. but it does make a significant difference depending upon where you're at for both voting in the August primary and for ballot access to the August primary. Whether or not you get a so-called second bite of the apple, well, and we'll talk party. about that. Later. Right, but those, you know, those are the kinds of issues that we expect to talk about. Other counties have similar issues, but obviously, as our largest jurisdiction, it makes time. And then the other time. issue is that if they have to change ED boundaries, yeah, um, you'll be running the June primary with different boundaries That's than true. the August. Right. Also in touch with the voter registration right. vendors because of the time it will take the counties to move the right. voters. Right. Obviously, they're sure. maybe going to have a week to do that. Yeah. Okay. So right. Our staff is working closely with them because that's the process. Right. 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 Okay. Anything else from the executive? No. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we'll move on to the elections operations, which I think has a similar issue, right, Tom? <laughs> so we have Tom Connolly and Brendan LaVolle. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Obviously, as, as Tom stated before, ballot access was um, definitely consuming most of our time. Uh, we received over 1,500 individual ballot access documents in a very short period of time, and I want to take obviously uh, an opportunity to thank all of our staff and operations and, and the staff and other units who really pitch in to help us get through not just the intake but also um, the, the objection process. Um, from an operations standpoint, obviously we, we helped prepare the prima facie determination list, which the commissioners took action on. Uh, we held a webinar on the guidance for the counties uh, with regard to the new uh, early canvassing law. We had prepared guidance that we circulated to all of them. We held a webinar where we went over um, that guidance and we provided them with an opportunity to kind of ask any questions they may have about the change. Uh, we've been collecting copies of pertinent information, the network security surveys, the procedures to prevent early release of results, and the early voting security documents, uh, as we do before every election from the counties. Uh, we did provide a new template for candidate notices based on some of the changes that were made, especially for the early canvassing law. Uh, and we've been collecting those documents from the county so that we have a full set uh, to know when certain tasks are, being, are taking place in each county. Um, we've also been collecting and entering the local filer information that we receive from counties into the CAPA system. Um, obviously, most of the ballot access for state legislature and Congress and the statewides come here. There are some that still do file locally. Um, so we've been collecting that information uh, from the, those of the larger counties so that we could have the full set of, of data here. Uh, and obviously there are a lot of operational questions with regard to the, the, the August primary. Uh, we've been trying to think those through and, and, and as uh, Kristen said, uh, I have reached out to um, the voter registration system vendors. Uh, obviously not all of them may have the technological capacity to maintain two sets of lines at the same time. So trying to figure out how the county boards are going to execute that is certainly going to be challenging, but I'm trying to really wrap my head around uh, the technology, um, what's capable of and what's not capable of, and try to find options for kind of managing this. <laughs> That's it, folks. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for coming out. 
Um, with regard to voting systems, Tom, can I let's, sure before you go on, let me just I, I have a question. So the new procedure for absentees, when does I mean if, if the June twenty eighth primary continues, what's the first day for absentees? Uh, well, the May thirteenth is the forty sixth day before the election, which is the statutory uh, the state statute uh, okay. deadline for military and overseas. So that would be the deadline by which they have to send those out. Obviously, the beginning of canvassing, um, depending on when the first ballot could come back from that right. batch, um, probably sometime the next week would be the earliest. So are the boards like going to tell us what their process is for, and I mean, under this new law, they have this four day window to process each absentee ballot as it's received. Are they giving any indication of how they're going to, are, are, are counties submitting plans for how to do this? Or do we know how they're going to do it, or are they just on their own now to determine how they want to do it as far as timing? So do they do it every day, do they do it every third. I mean, how, do we know? Or so what I would say is that the as far as there's two parts of the information that they have to provide to us. Number one was simply when they're doing the scanning of those early process absentees, which happens twice before election day. How do they prevent the release of any of those results? Um, that would be included as kind of a you know an appendix or just an add-on to what they currently provide us now for early voting, how do they prevent the release of results during the early voting process. Um, with regard to the candidate notice, uh, it does state in the candidate notice uh, when the boards are going to be doing their canvassing. Uh, it would be in that document that any specific board would probably lay out to the candidates how they're going to go about it. We did explain to them on the conference calls uh, on a number of different occasions that they could do it every day if that's their desire. Um, or if they could, they could do it Mondays, Thursdays, you know, so that as long as it's, it could be done within a four day window. Um, and then that certainly means that they may convene so that there's a regular schedule. Doesn't mean that there's necessarily ballots for them to process, but then at least if the candidates know what the schedule should be. So if I show up on Thursday and the board says, we're here to, um, you know, to, to look at ballots, but we haven't received any, you know, in the last four days, then that would be the case where they would say, I guess, adjourn to the next, um, Scheduled day for so, I mean, is there any any uh, leeway, say, within a plan where maybe early, because you're not getting many in, you do it every fourth day, but as you get closer and you're getting a large volume of absentees in, you might want to ramp it up and do it every two days or something more often. So on, you know, that fourth day, you're not you're not swimming in absentees well, to deal with, or is there anything like that going on? Or are you they're aware? giving notice to the candidates? So they really need to stick to that. So they stick to that notice, so right. that the candidates could be there. But right. Sometimes they should, if there's nothing to count, they just they would just say we're here and we're adjourning into the next. Yeah. Or yeah. Or whatever, mm -hmm. the website. So yeah. We, we did send them guidelines. Correct. correct. Right. We sent them guidelines. But, they, and but the choice, just to be clear, the choice is a local one. As yeah. long as they stay within the statute. Mm -hmm. Yes, as long as they comply with the four-day window for processing ballots upon four days from one day receipt. <laughs> And we okay. do get copies of those letters, so we do. So we know what the county is doing. We know what yeah. they're sending out to the counties and what their schedules. Um, with regard to voting systems, obviously uh, we're also busy on that front as well. Uh, Dominion and Hart are uh, un going currently going through testing. Uh, Dominion is just, I guess, going through its normal courses. Hart is currently in the middle of a uh, federal certification for the system that they're submitting to New York. Um, they're wrapping up that federal certification at the end of this month, and then they would start working on the, the Delta or any additional New York specific requirements um, that would be required for us uh, afterwards. They don't have a time frame yet as far as when that would come before the commissioners after it's fully tested. Um, with regard to clear ballot, again, there are two things. There's clear count 2.2, which is just an update to the current uh, central count software. Um, we are nearing completion on that testing, and we would hope that there's a possibility of having a commissioner's meeting uh, at the beginning or early in June so that we could bring that before you for potential certification. Uh, I know there are certain counties that would be interested in using that uh, update for the clear for the central count software. Uh, in addition, clear ballot has uh, clear vote 2.4, which is their full uh, precinct voting system. Uh, that is still in the kind of application process. We have reviewed their ballots. We're waiting for them to provide us with some results from a test deck that's part of the process. Uh, we anticipate that before or at the next meeting, we would have a resolution for the commissioners to permit the operations unit to move forward with testing of that system. And ESNS uh, did submit an application for a full voting system. We've been working with them, uh, got some questions for completeness, and we would anticipate along the same time frame as the clear ballot uh, 2.4, which is at the next meeting, we'd probably have a resolution for you 
to uh, permit us to move forward with the testing of that system. And what is the ES in that system? The ES in that system, it's a, well, it's a, it's a complete voting is system. Part of Express Vote or is it? Uh, the Express Vote yes, XL. The Express Vote XL is one of the hardware components of the system. Uh, the previous one that was certified was 6041. This one is 6301. It is a brand new EMS. It's running on Windows 10. It has the DS200, which many counties have now. It also has a DS300. Um, it has the Express Vote XL. It has a DS950. 450, 850, 950. Right, the 450 and the 850 were previously uh, certified. The 950 is the newest piece of hardware, but all three of those central count scanners are being uh, included in the submission as well. So it is a full suite of, of, of the voting system. I just wanted to thank you for your hard work, of course, for your validation, but just to say hi while I was here. Thank you for everything. Okay. No uh, with regard to the electronic poll book systems, Unless there's any questions on voting machines? I don't think there are any more. So we should expect at our next meeting we're going to see some of these new system applications. The next meeting for clear ballots full system and the ESNS uh, submission, we would have resolutions as we had in the past for Hart and Dominion, just stating that we've received yep, our application, right. we right. reviewed that, it. Yeah, yeah, just to give you approval to go ahead with the Correct. Yep. Right. Yep, yep. Okay. And the only thing would be the clear count 2.2, we would be looking for a vote on certain. So nothing's ready to be recertified now or newly uh, certified. Just the clear count 2.2 modification. That will that is that is ready to go. Well, we will we would it will be yeah. ready to go. We'll be ready to go by the next. It week. will be. okay. Okay. Uh, with regard to the electronic poll book systems, uh, we did get submissions from all three vendors uh, for review of their updated configurations for use at the primary election. We went through the testing process. We utilized uh, internal staff, staff from IT, and also nice tech. Uh, we did complete that testing. We provided reports to the commissioners for their review, and we have a resolution later on the agenda um, seeking approval of those three configurations. Uh, with a couple of miscellaneous items, we continue to work with uh, IT and PIO on the absentee tracker uh, to kind of help shepherd that along and make sure that the, the voter registration system vendors who are providing that information to uh, the state board for its tracker are on schedule to provide the full slate of data elements that were required in that bill. Uh, we have researched and identified a vendor that will allow for the aggregation of clear ballot results and either Dominion or ESNS on election day. One of the um, questions that came up with from counties uh, with regard to the, the early canvas bill is that they wanted to use uh, their clear ballot central count system for canvassing of the absentee ballots. Um, and they wanted to use, obviously, their normal Dominion or ESNS systems for early voting on Election Day. Um, the bill that the early canvassing bill required that uh, the results from the early canvassed absentees be included in election night results. Um, obviously, they can't do any of that work until the earliest 8 p.m. on Election Day, and the systems don't necessarily speak to one another very well. Uh, so it would have required a lot of manual intervention uh, between the uh, the, the county boards to kind of input the information from one system into another in that kind of one hour window or two hour window to get to 10 o'clock at night on election day, which is when they send us their first set of results. Um, we, there was a, a vendor that did a project in uh, New Jersey that had did something similar where New Jersey had uh, early voting money to buy new systems. They bought uh, one set of systems from one vendor and they had election day systems from another vendor and they were able to use this utility to aggregate those results for election night. So uh, we have, we're working on a procurement with that vendor uh, to offer that service to the, the counties. There's about 23 of them that are looking to, to use this tool to aggregate those results on election night. And then last but not least, I'm sure Michael probably mentioned it, but um, he and I and uh, Ben Spear, our sister, will be uh, presenting at NICE Glitta, uh, the New York State Local Government IT Directors Association Conference, uh, later this week in Syracuse, as we tend to do every year, um, just as we kind of we like to try to practice what we preach with county boards, having good relationships with their local IT resources. Um, and so at the state level, we like to take the opportunity to go to their conference, just to kind of give them an update on uh, a number of things that are likely going to be impacting the IT directors themselves, whether it be our cyber regs, any kind of remediation uh, grants and or activities that we're doing, and they're usually very keen uh, for an update on the election hardware and technology update. That's all I have, Brendan. Brendan, anything? Well, thank you. <laughs> and your, your report on the status of uh, 
the uh, Westchester report. Sure. The, the 2020 results. So we we did uh, obviously reach out to to Westchester and we did receive two boxes of documentation um, that I will uh, be happy to tell you that I have not been able to kind of necessarily go through just yet. Uh, obviously with ballot access, it is sitting in my office. I will take a look through it. Um, it does look like they did try to provide us documentation on all the things that we had requested, uh, the logic and accuracy testing, their uh, post-election audits, um, everything that we kind of asked them so that we can kind of do a thorough look into uh, their processes to see why, if there was any reason we can come up with why there were those perceived anomalous numbers in the blanks and voids from the 2020 election. Thank you. Anything else? Hearing nothing, we'll move on to the council's office. That's Kim Galvin and Brian Quayle. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to echo everyone else's sentiments about ballot access and uh, how hard all the staff has worked. In addition to, uh, we had about 25 ballot access lawsuits. Most were near completion or completed when the Court of Appeals came down with a ruling. It did cause a, a bit of confusion with the judiciary and the candidates, and there was lots of arguments whether or not the judges should continue with the cases. Most, to the best of my knowledge, stopped and held them in abeyance pending, I don't know, further direction. I think the, con the confusion is going to continue until we get deeper into the August primary and the calendar dates that may be developed in the ballot access requirements. Um, I know that we're gonna discuss the redistricting litigation more specifically, but just generally for the people that might be listening, uh, Brian Quayle and I have had two conference calls with the judge uh, in Steuben County. We have another call scheduled. We've spoken with the Department of Justice twice. We have another call scheduled. Um, and that people might not know that there was an order to show cause to intervene seeking to invalidate the assembly lines yesterday or last evening. Uh, I haven't checked the docket to see if anything has happened with that. So that's keeping us busy um, up until this point. And in other litigation that uh, you may be interested in, uh, we were sued in the Eastern District of New York by the Libertarian Party, Schmidt versus Nicebo, regarding the use of non-residents uh, to be petition witnesses. If it rings a bell, it's because they did it before. And uh, that case was only mooted by the fact that they met the requisite uh, voting requirements and actually became a party. I believe that case is being argued, the PI on that today, at some point today. Um, we filed a declaration in opposition to the case, um, basically stating, you know, they waited until the very day the day before these independent nominating petitions were supposed to be circulated before they brought it and citing confusion because some had already been out circulating independent nominating petitions at the time of this litigation. Now I would argue that there's even more confusion regarding everything. So um, the attorney general's office is representing us on that. And uh, I don't know if Brian has heard anything back yet today, but um, I suspect we'll hear how that argument went in short order. Um, we were also notified on April 19th, although we haven't been served yet, that we're going to be brought into the Facella v. Adams, which is the non-citizen voting case litigation in Staten Island. Thankfully, that hasn't hit our desk as of yet. Um, motion dismissed has been filed in the and I lost the NICEBO feed, but I'll keep talking. A motion to dismiss has been filed in the Brooklyn NAACP line warming case. Plaintiff's response is due 524. And the DCCC matter uh, regarding cures and primarily a wrong church issue, the motion to dismiss was filed and the plaintiff's opposition memo is due uh, mid-May. Uh, with regard to the other work of the unit, uh, the compliance staff, when not working specs, has continued the normal work, 
reviews, meetings, foils, several subpoenas. Con the new contribution limits have been posted in the training unit as well into their campaign finance seminars. Uh, we've also had two retirements in the past few weeks, so I'd like to wish Mark Pop and Kathleen Pachoka well and tell them that I'm jealous as they enter into their well, this well-deserved stage. There you are back uh, in their lives. And uh, lastly, the council's office has participated in, you know, the variety of meetings and calls that we always do. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I know we're, I think we're planning on talking more about the redistricting matter at later in the, the program here. But uh, other than that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer, answer them. Um. Can you give us any information on the activities in the compliance unit? Well, try and ask the numbers. Um, just understanding that they, you know, they were obviously working the petitions and the specifications of objections almost full time for the past few weeks. But Brian has some numbers for us. So the um, uh, since inception, the total number of uh, reports uh, received is 187,574, um, and currently there are 10,823 out for assignment. So that would be the number that hasn't been um, placed into another category as of yet. Since the last meeting, 3,534 reviews were completed. Um, and since January uh, 2022, 1,326 committees and 1,239 candidate records have been terminated. Um, and, and indeed, since the last board meeting, 478 terminations by, of committees and 467 candidate records terminated. That would be the, the 50,000 foot view of the work of the uh, unit. And as Kim mentioned, um, the bulk of the unit's work um, in recent weeks has been on um, review of specifications and objections. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for council? If not, we'll move on to enforcement. Michael Johnson. Hi, everyone. I'll give you guys a, a sort of a heads up, uh, an overview view of what the unit's been up to thus far. We've relocated. We are now on the 10th floor and, you know, there's still a few things that we are working on. The end of the week, we, end of last week, rather, we managed to, we got our, our furniture and we now have phones. So that's great. There are a few things that, that still needed, that still need to be addressed, um, primarily doors and locks. So that hopefully should be addressed soon. Um, those outstanding issues are still being addressed. We coordinated the move, of course, with OGS, ITS, uh, Davies office furniture are and off moving. There were a lot of moving pieces. And, and at this point, I'm just glad that we actually have phones and places to sit. So that, that's great. Um, we, as far as our case management program is concerned, we've been looking at different case management programs and thus far what we have seen doesn't quite meet our needs or the price is just astronomical. So we are still pursuing a sort of an in-house type of situation, which I think will probably wind up working for what we need. And it's requiring, it'll take a couple of tweaks with that. We're still working with ITS. We're developing a, a whole judgment database so we can track um, better the judgments that we do get. Um, I've presented to, to the board our quarterly report. So you guys have that. There's a handful um, of hearing officer cases that are, that are now in the works. Um, we no, well, were, Michael, I, Michael, I just have to stop you for a second there. The quarterly report that you uh, alluded to, I, I, I don't have that. <clears throat> Neither do I. Oh, Did you, you guys give don't? It to yeah, I don't have it. Did you give it to staff or? I don't. It didn't make uh, it to me, at least, or any of the commissioners, I guess. 
So if okay. you, I mean, after the meeting, could you just make sure? Yeah, we get I'll that? make certain you guys get it. it. Yeah, I'll make certain you guys get that after the okay. meeting. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Um, I was hoping that by this board meeting we'd have our our website that we spoke about up and running, but our enforcement tech specialist he's he's had a a, a, a medical situation and. Um, He's actually, I don't know when, but at some point today, he's actually undergoing surgery. So we've kind of moved that on the back burner, and that will hopefully get done sooner than later. Um, as far as staffing goes, we are unfortunately losing one of our associate councils. So that will take on a whole process of um, putting out feelers for a new council. And other than that, I will give you guys an update on where we are with our LLC project. Now, as you know, in February, we started our LLC process. And what we did was we had identified all the transactions that had been reported by committees where the contributor type was an LLC. What we, once we did that, we then compared the list of all the filed LLCs to the list of LLCs that were reported as, you know, contributing to a committee. That resulted in roughly 3,841 LLCs that did not have a statement of interest on file. We took those numbers and all the unmatched reported LLC contributions were combined into a single list. We re did a manual review and removed some duplicate entries. And based on that, we identified 3,706 entities that were reported as LLC, as contributing LLCs that did not have an SOI on file. That was the number of letters that we mailed out. As of the 27th of April, we had contact with roughly 520 entities regarding the LLC letters. And I'm talking about phone conversations and emails back and forth with regard to whether or not they were LLCs. Now, of those, of that four, 520 number, 409 of them confirmed that they were, in fact, an LLC. That number factored in as roughly 78%. We used our contacts and applied that to the total number of letters we sent out, and it came out to about 78%. So we used that 78% as a sample of entities that probably were LLCs. So if you apply the 78%, to all the letters we came out, that would result, we anticipated getting roughly 2,890 entities that were LLCs. As of April 10th, the state board had a total of 3,446 statement of interests on file. That's 2,000 516 more that were on file in February, on February 10th when we first started the project. So that's a, and those, that number is directly related to the letters that we, we, we sent out. Now, the number that we started looking at in February, that number was 930. That's how many statement of interests that were on file. So even though you had that number of statement of interests on file, not all of those LLCs actually came up in our review as making campaign contributions. Now, that was a little bit interesting because what that showed was, I mean, by filing a statement of interest, an LLC is almost self-reporting that they made a contribution during the applicable year. Now, this disparity, what it 
pointed out to us was that the committee, either intentionally or not, misreported the contribution as coming from an LLC. So that was one of the issues that we managed to find. Now, although Michael, I have a question, Michael. I have, yes. Can I ask a question? I have a question. So this this uh, filing that the LLC makes, uh, do, what do they tell us in that filing? Are you talking about? We're talking the SOI. I guess you're calling it. What is oh, okay. what, what, what's on that filing? The statement of interest basically <laughs> states that they are an LLC and let me see. And it gives a breakdown of who who is made up of that LLC and this way the committees can attribute the contributions to the apportioned share of the individuals who make up that LLC. That's essentially what the statement of interest tells you. So the LLC filing does not indicate on it who that LLC gave to. I don't understand the question, Peter. The question is, if I filing as an LLC at the end of the year, I don't have to list on there the contributions I made that year. No, that's that not what this. Yeah, no, that's not what the statement of interest lists. I, I see that. So, so now you've got a situation where the LLCs file, and you don't have any record that they filed. I mean, wouldn't it be helpful if the if that filing told us who they filed or who they gave to that year? Oh, that wouldn't would be a helpful part of that filing by the LLC. That would Since be. Since they're not doing it till the end of the year, they could do that for us, right? Yes, they could. I mean, essentially, the I have the statement of identity in front of me. It talks, gives you the legal name of the LLC, the names of all the direct donors, the names of the indirect donors, and it gives you a percentage. It does not tell you anything about how much the LLC contributed and to who. I mean, have we considered adding that since, I mean, I know it's a bone of contention about when they file. I think we all agree they should be filing at the beginning of the year and not at the end of the year. But since they are, would it be helpful if that filing gave us the information we want, which is who did you give to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So are we looking at changing the form to address that, to include that? We could look at changing the form. It might be more helpful if the statute required that. Well, no, I agree with you, but I'm just saying that we could ask for that, at least, even if the statute doesn't ask for it. I mean, I think we have a couple. As I, as I see, we have two statutory issues of this law. One is the timing, and secondly is the lack of penalty for failure to file. Uh, at least I have those problems. I think the filing and, should be done earlier, and there should be a penalty if they don't file. But right now, we don't have a statutory penalty. But I'm just asking if it would be helpful or better if they gave us more information when they do file at the end of the year now. Oh yeah, it would be helpful. It would be helpful not only to the board, but it would actually be helpful to the committees. Because if, for instance, if a committee received a contribution in May and they don't get the allocation information at that time, then they have to, you know, under the law, they have to wait till the end of the year to get the information. This prevents the committee from being able to identify and prevent over contributions from the owners of the LLC. So what can happen is you have a corporate, you have a committee that spends the contributions and then at the end of the year, they determine the owner of the LLC might have contributed in their own name as well, as well as the LLC. And now they have a situation where they have an over contribution. If the committee has already spent those funds, now the committee needs to come up with the over contribution amount to refund the to make a refund on that. So that's that's another issue that we managed to find during our whole LLC process. Another issue that was found, and a lot of these issues that that we find, if you're doing a, say, for instance, if you want to do an analysis 
of all the LLCs and over contributions. While your analysis and whatever methodology you used might be correct, the data may not be. So even though you, your, your numbers, you know, where you've added and subtracted is correct, it's the data that can very well be problematic. Um, another instance that we ran into was where you have a pack that was reporting contributions as coming from an LLC, it's coming from LLCs, and they were actually not coming from LLCs. You had sort of situations where you had trade organizations that were collecting membership dues, and, and Brian Quayle and his folks were great at, at sending out letters to people to point out how to remedy the situation. So you had people making um, membership due um, payments, and because they did not know they were supposed to opt out, their membership dues were considered political contributions, and that's why they were reported. And that was another, that was just yet another thing that we stumbled upon that caused the information to be quite misleading when you just look at uh, a committee's filings and make a determination on how the LLCs. What we also did was in our review, there was a disproportionate, a disproportionate amount of sort of mom and pop type LLCs that were making contributions. And um, it's my guess in just what we've looked at, a lot of the contributions were, you know, that we've been hearing about coming from large organizations. We've, we've actually stumbled into a couple where LLCs were, had ownership in the name of a corporation. And because the law doesn't require the allocation to be broken down if the owner is a corporation, that was another issue that we happen to find out. Um, and because there's no requirement for the committees to return a contribution, if the LLC fails to file a statement of interest, what we have to do is essentially you'd have to go after a committee for, uh, for failure, for filing false information because there's no allocation information there. There are a lot of issues with regard to different human factors that we call them in terms of the name of the LLC versus how it's listed versus you may have an entity that owns a bunch of different nursing homes and they may come in as the doing business name of the LLC and not under the LLC exactly. So that is another issue that we have encountered and we are working on that. Now that the letters have gone out, our next steps is to start looking at the LLCs that have statement of identity forms on file, but yet there is nothing showing on a, in committees as far as contributions from these LLCs. And just the few that we started looking at for whatever reason, the committees did not list their contributions as coming from LLCs. They listed them as coming from corporations. So what we are going to be doing is doing that whole process of looking at the hundreds of LLCs that have statements of identity on file, but yet no corresponding contributions in committees that list them as LLCs. So let me ask you a question. Brian, are we finding a lot in compliance? Are we finding a lot of failures to list out LLC information on, the, on our filers' filings if they don't have the information they can't contribute um, it out? Is that a 
a common compliance issue? It is a relatively common compliance issue. I don't recall the specific numbers. Prior to, you know, previously, last year, we had identified LLC contributions for which the committees had not given the necessary attribution information on the attribution schedule and had reached out to committees and sought compliance from them. And it was in the hundreds. And the, you know, the work that the Enforcement Council is doing now is far more comprehensive. On the LLC side, it's exclusive. We didn't do anything to reach out to the LLCs via compliance. But we have definitely, because we do publish the list of statements of identity, and we've been updating them, I believe, weekly. It has been helping more, helping, excuse me, helping committees come into compliance because there's a much greater reservoir of LLCs that have published that information. So to the extent that they were being recalcitrant when the committees reached them, they seem to have been more responsive when Mr. Johnson has reached out to them. Okay. And we were thankful. Glad to help, Brian. So, I mean, essentially what we've, and, you know, and the thing is, if there is no LLC in the name, and that's another thing that we've picked up, if there is no LLC in the name, it might possibly not get flagged by compliance. And that is, that would be sort of an issue with regard to how the committee enters the information. Sometimes they don't necessarily always enter in that it's an LLC, even though the check itself might say LLC on it. So there are a lot of different steps that we are going through to sort of get a handle on how to sort of drill down further, if you will, in terms of the issue. Okay. Okay. Well, keep us appraised. I appreciate your report. Thank you. Are there any questions for Michael on that or anything else? Good report. Commissioner Kellner stepped out, but if he has a question, I'm sure he'll raise it when he comes back. Thanks, Michael. I guess we'll move on then. Are you done? I'm sorry. No, I thought... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Commissioner. Yeah, I was muted. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I'm listening to this, and this gets very complicated because you have all these LLCs out there with the names, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I always thought that when I was dealing with this, because to pin it in the neck to get a letter and you owe X number of dollars at the end of the year out of your campaign account, why don't we have a discussion and see if it's possible with the Secretary of State? And I always thought that ownership should have a designation, either a number or something, and when they contribute, they have to contribute with that number. The number, we would have a permanent relationship with what that number meant to that particular LLC, and it would be simple. So that the issue, the issuance would be when a new LLC gets issued, each member of the LLC gets a campaign contribution number. And the same would go for the existing ones, and after a while, it'd be easy to track them. It also saves a lot of time putting the same address down all the time on your forms. But I know that's long range and it's esoteric, but I think it would work if you could get it done. You could do the same with corporations and where their addresses are. I think it can be done. I think it should be talked about, but it would go a long way to solving some of these problems. But nothing would work unless you have a penalty attached to it. Absolutely. I agree 100%, Commissioner. So, and at the last board meeting, Commissioner Kaczynski talked about a potential penalty for LLCs who don't file their statement of identity, which I fully support. And Commissioner Kellner, excuse me, Commissioner Kaczynski, if I'm not mistaken, I think you had also suggested that 
these um, statement of identity forms should be filed earlier. That would that would go very far in alleviating a lot of the issues that we have come up against, and it would be even more helpful to all of the different committees who have to wait until the end of the year to get the information. So, I mean, I think those are two things that would be a huge help if we can get them done. Okay, agreed. <clears throat> Did you have something else, Michael? No, that that's that's just, yeah, that's that's essentially it. Commissioner Spano, are you satisfied or? Yeah, I, you no, I just want to make sure I know how tough all this stuff is. It's not it's not easy to get it done, but I remember the LLC thing was like the Wild West ten years ago. I mean, you know, some guy had have ten LLCs and contribute all over the place. Fair enough. Anything else for Michael Johnson? No. Michael, thank you for that. We'll go You're on welcome. to NVRA, NVRA PIO. It's John Conklin, Jennifer Wilson. I believe John is out. And Jennifer? Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I just want to echo the statements that have been already made regarding the staff and their handling of ballot access. It really was incredible. It's my first time doing it, so it was very exciting to see and the effort that was put in there. Um, the PIO unit been extremely busy the last two months handling a lot of requests related to redistricting and also ballot access. We received in March 171 FOIL requests, <clears throat> in April 266. Uh, all of those related to voter data as well as FOIL requests for petitions and also seeing who's on the ballot. A lot of phone calls related to those issues as well, as well as redistricting. Our website, we posted our statement regarding the redistricting case. We've also updated it since Friday. We posted the Who Filed page, uh, the revised 2022 election law book, as well as the special election calendar for Assembly District 58, election night reporting for a special election for Assembly District 20 and 43. And we also held meetings with the Campaign Finance Board related to their website as well. A lot of press inquiries, as you might imagine, this month and or last month mainly. At the beginning of April, we issued a press release regarding the new absentee ballot tracker that did receive some attention. We also issued our statement regarding the redistricting court decision, and both John and I have been handling a lot of press inquiries regarding redistricting, regarding who's on the ballot, regarding ballot objections. Something else we've been working on recently as well to increase our presence on social media with our cybersecurity election analysts. They have been working on a plan to increase our social media presence so we can quickly get out information, especially in light of the redistricting case, to make sure that voters are abreast on exactly what's happening, exactly the deadlines they need to be following. Our Twitter page has been getting a lot of traction. Last month we had uh, 12,000 profile visits and our tweets received 172,000 impressions. An impression is basically anytime someone sees a tweet. And those tweets were all related to the launch of the Who File page, as well as our information on redistricting and the new absentee ballot tracker. Our Facebook wasn't quite as impressive, but it's something that the staff is going to be working on going forward. NVRA and NIVE voter in 2022 so far, the staff have done 12 visits and reviews. They're going to continue to work on that, although now with the uh, new primary, they are going to make sure that they're not going to be putting too much burden on the counties as they're looking ahead to that. So they're working on a schedule now. NVRA, the PIO unit conducted an NVRA training for SUNY. We had 58 individuals representing SUNY schools from around the state on that. It was very, very successful. The staff did a great job. Uh, grants have been extremely busy as well. Our three early voting grants, the early voting expansion grant, the e book grant, and our eight localities grant were all extended in the state budget. And so now we will be extending those for counties to continue to submit claims for payment to help pay for early voting coming up. So for the early voting expansion grant, we have $297,000 remaining. The e book grant, $273,000 remaining. <coughs> In our aid to localities grant, we have $97,000 remaining. Also very exciting, we have a new grant that is gonna be coming out. We will have a $4 million prepaid postage grant that we are working on finalizing, figuring out how we'll be distributing that. There is a new law related to requiring prepaid postage for absentee applications and absentee return ballots. 
that will go into effect on July 1. So we are determining exactly how that $4 million will be divided among the counties and we'll be issuing contracts <coughs> to counties on that as well. On our federal grants, we submitted our semi-annual reports for our shoebox whole site improvement education and cybersecurity grants. We are getting some new cybersecurity money, $3.2 million, which we'll be using for our internal cybersecurity systems. And we're finalizing the grant narrative and budget for that right now. And then just quickly, as far as have a money that we have left education and training, we have 1.2 million remaining. Our pool site improvement, 988,000. Our shoebox, 5.5 million. And our cybersecurity remediation, 2.5 million. And I am happy to take any questions related to any of these issues. Are there any questions? I don't hear any questions. Must have, must have been complete. Good job. Okay, thank you. And now well, we'll move on to ITU. Michael Haber. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, so uh, I'll give some brief updates on our IT activity since the last meeting. Um, first, given the recent uh, redistricting court decision, IT staff over the last few days have reviewed potential impacts to our various applications and processes, and we are prepared to support the addition of the second primary as needed and to support um, a repeat if needed of the redistricting uploads by the county boards and tonight's vote. In terms of Tapas Fidus, we continue our regular internal meetings with the several business units on enhancements and other updates. Uh, we're also working on an additional import capability under development for the electronic filing system to allow the import of independently created files, such as, uh, for example, Excel files with appropriate validation. Uh, the Campus Fidus team uh, continues to make updates to EFS in support of the public campaign finance system, excuse me, as an interim solution uh, until the uh, final solution can be procured, as we discussed earlier. Uh, that works proceeding as planned. Um, we have continued to support public campaign finance in terms of requirements gathering and review of the scope of work uh, in those reviews with OGS. Uh, and the new website for PCFE that's under development um, with IT assistance, uh, which will be hosted by the ITS Web Services Group. So training for our staff on their content management system has begun. In terms of the online voter registration and automatic voter registration system, um, the procurement, uh, as you may recall, we submitted a vendor uh, after careful review by the DOA evaluation team. Uh, contractual discussions have since been conducted by OGS, although the contract has not yet been awarded. Um, given some of those delays, we have begun reviewing the potential for several uh, backup options as a precaution, uh, such as internal development and the possibility of obtaining and modifying existing software from that's in use elsewhere in New York State or beyond. Uh, we also continue in OVR AVR to have uh, regular meetings with several participating uh, AVR agencies as well as ITS and the county voter registration vendors. Uh, and look forward to resuming the county board working group that had previously been established. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the absentee ballot request portal is currently up and running, as is the absentee ballot tracker, uh, which was successfully deployed by the April 1st target date. And we're currently able to display uh, all the required data elements which are provided by the various local voter registration systems. We've also provided support on space expansion. Um, at this point, we've completed network connectivity for all the new locations uh, on the additional floors. Uh, in addition, the, the VoIP or the phone connectivity uh, has been established for all the occupied areas on those floors, thanks to our team providing some significant support to ITS. Uh, and we have uh, begun efforts to perform an infrastructure refresh to upgrade uh, much of our server and storage infrastructure, both at our data center and at our disaster recovery location. In terms of security, uh, given current events in particular, we do continue to receive regular information and updates from our cybersecurity partners at the state and federal levels. And we also continue to make ongoing improvements in security to, to our network. And our Secure Election Center team regularly monitors traffic on our network and reviews anything that looks out of the ordinary. 
Uh, as was also mentioned, uh, our security staff provided vulnerability scanning and related support to operations and reviewing the updates to the whole book systems, uh, and continue to review cyber regulation reporting from the local county board. Uh, we also continue to work with uh, NYSEC and numerous counties on implementation of their risk remediation efforts. Uh, as was mentioned previously, the, um, uh, the grant deadline uh, for those remediation plan efforts has been extended, and we also further extended the cyber advisory services available to counties through NYSEC. Uh, and we continue to work with the uh, SUNY Center for Technology and Government on their elections infrastructure review project. Uh, and lastly, as uh, Tom had mentioned, we will be <coughs> represented and presenting this week at the, uh, the spring conference for the New York State Local Government IT Directors Association, providing them updates on DOE initiatives that affect county IT networks. Uh, we have found them to be a very productive partner to work with over the past few years. Uh, are there any questions? Um, go ahead. Yep. Are, are we on schedule for implementation of the online voter registration and automatic voter registration programs by next year? I will say that, uh, you know, I frankly do have some concerns about that given the delays in procuring the contract. Um, and that's why we have uh, pursued some of these potential backup methods. Um, I do have high confidence that if needed, we could have a uh, simple system that would meet the basic requirements uh, of the statute that we would be able to develop internally. Uh, whether we did that starting with an existing software that we procured from someplace else, uh, such as wasn't used elsewhere in New York or perhaps being used by another state, uh, or even if we did need to start essentially from scratch. So I do have confidence in our team being able to do that uh, by the date provided. Um, however, that of course was not our, our A plan. Our A plan was to procure software through the uh, extensive RFP that uh, we undertook last year. Okay. Any other questions for uh, Michael? No? Thank you. That completes the staff report, so we will move on to the next agenda item, which is old business. Is there any old business to come before us? Yeah. I guess the answer is no. All right. Then uh, is there any new business to come before us besides we have, well, we do have some new business. No. All right, so we have regulations, and I think the first one we'll take up is 2206, which is the early voting regulation. And does someone want to just explain that quickly to us so we know what we're talking about? Absolutely. So this um, is a an updating of the regulation to reflect um, changes in the statute <clears throat> for the uh, the numbers applicable um, to um, uh, early uh, vote, the number of early voting sites, um, to change it from the current formulation that deals with uh, one for every full increment of 50,000 to um, the formulation that for counties over um, 500,000, it's one for every 40,000, and then for counties under 500,000, the law now requires that um, a uh, early voting site be um, provided for, uh, for every full increment of 30,000. Uh, so we had a very helpful chart um, in the uh, regulations uh, for uh, counties to see based on their uh, voter population how many early voting sites they needed that needed to be updated for the statutory change. That's the principal change. Um, and there were also um, uh, some other changes to the statute in terms of the requirement uh, for the largest city to have uh, an early voting site. I mean, in, in as much as we had placed um, all of the other standards from the statute in the regulation, uh, subdivision C on the second to last page, uh, we thought it appropriate to just add that into the regulation as well so that all of the relevant uh, rules would be in one place for any county consulting them to do what to do. So this is um, uh, pretty much a um, uh, a conforming um, set of changes to the early voting uh, uh, early voting uh, site regulations to conform with statutory changes. Brian, um, Brian, when you say pretty much, is there anything in here that goes beyond the statute? 
I don't think so. You think this is just a resuscitation of what the statute amendments were? Yes, and I'll be honest with you, the only thing that I have um, some question about is we, and I'm noticing that we set the deadline for the designation of the full site the 30 days before, right. instead of 46, and off the top of my head, um, I don't remember um, if that particular change in A was driven by the statute or just practicality. Okay. Go. Oh, oh I, actually, I do under, I, oh, yeah. It's not driven, I don't, it, it may be driven by a statutory change, but the reason for it is because we now have special elections um, that can occur not in the 70 to 80 day time frame, but in the 40 to 50 day time frame because they truncated them for um, for assembly and Senate special elections. Okay. So we would have had the perversity of having a designation of early voting site designation potentially before there would be a proclamation. So that's why that changed. There. And I don't think that's statutory. Right, just to understand number three, basically you're re just repeating the statute. We have no regulations pertaining to this siting of a polling place in the city, correct? Yes, that is that, that, that there's no part of that that is our determination that is restating the statutory requirements. So you're, you're not because endorsing it. I, am, <laughs> I, also, I also understand that there's some legislation pending that may require about a couple of more places. So. There are a few, yes. And then as those um, are adopted, this is it's more difficult. Yeah. 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 This whole notion of one size fits all doesn't work when it comes to the boards. I just wish the legislature would understand that. Um, I got personally involved with trying to help the county commissioner trying to find a place where it's impossible to find in small communities a place that's available for 12 days in a row. It's just impossible. So it worked out. So. Okay, uh, any other questions on this regulation or a motion? I move uh, adoption of the resolution 22 Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. And we'll go on to the next regulation, which is the 6215.2D. Uh, and uh, well, that's about independent. Petition. Somebody could maybe just briefly explain that one. Yes. Um, this this change is also um, a result of a statutory change. The statutory change is a little bit older, um, but um, in um, in the uh, changes to the independent nominating statewide signature requirement, which increased the signature requirement from fifteen thousand to forty five thousand, um, the uh, number of uh, valid signatures from at least one half of each of New York's congressional districts for independent nominating petitions was increased from 100 to 500. Right. And we have a reference in our regulation relating to um, cover sheets, which touches on the distribution schedule. And we, again, um, so that people would not be misled, I thought it was important to make this um, statutory conforming changes in the regulation as well. There is no um, Beyond the statute, substantive change uh, in the in the resolution, to my thinking. Oh, uh, moved. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. That's also adopted unanimously. Uh, next order is order of business is the appointment of the uh, Division of Election Law Enforcement of Special Investigator status. And I believe Michael Johnson requested this. Um, it confers um, special investigator status on one person, one additional person within the um, Division of Law Enforcement. Is there a second to that one? Second. And all in favor? I'm sorry, any questions and all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that's also carried unanimously. Next is the upgrade to the electronic poll books. This is resolution 2208. Again, I would ask for a brief explanation. As I mentioned during my unit report, Commissioner, uh, all three uh, approved poll book vendors have submitted updated configurations for their customers to use at the June 28th primary election. We did do our full suite of testing as we normally do. We provided uh, reports on that testing, and it is the recommendation of the operations unit that you approve the three uh, updated configurations. Uh, any questions or motions? 
so moved. Uh, I just add that uh, that the reports are fairly detailed. They right. were distributed to the commissioners, right. and the public should be aware that they are. Available. And they're available to the public. Right. Correct. Right. Yes. I'm sorry. I heard a motion from Commissioner Spano. Yep. Is there a second to that? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Again, that's carried unanimously. So that completes the business before the board. Uh, there is a request for an executive session, I believe, to discuss litigation. Um, I, I move that we go into executive session to discuss litigation. And I think, and I think, as noted earlier, as far as selecting a board meeting date, we'll have to maybe weigh our how oh, this calendar plays out before we can do that. So we'll put that off to a later date. I have a motion to move into executive session to discuss litigation. Is there a second? Second. And all in favor? Aye. Opposed? I will say for the public, we will not be coming back into public session after this. And so that is the end of the public session portion of the meeting. Thank you.